Four million years later. Hi there. Thank you for downloading and listening to the 4 Million Years Later podcast, the show where two friends get together and watch an episode of the Generation 1 Transformer series in story order and then convene to talk about what they saw. We grew up with the show. We are Gen Xers. We loved it as children. We continued to love the show into our teen years and into our young adult years. Spent the last 25 years talking on the phone about this show together and finally decided to start recording some of those conversations. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named... The Hooverizer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what does it mean to hooverize something? Mess it up. Make it horrible. <laughs> It's like, like when Homer Simpson changed his name to Max Power, and he said that uh, there's, o- there's only three ways to do things, the right way, the wrong way, and the Max Power way. And Bart says, oh, is that the wrong way? He's like, yeah, but faster. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we need to hooverize this situation. What does that mean? Make it incredibly inconvenient and wrongheaded. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, episode 22, and the reason that you called yourself the Hooverizer is because we're on the episode called... The Immobilizer. Oh, I thought two. it was just a complete coincidence. <laughs> just every week, you just keep playing with different identities. Hey, that's part of the cool cool thing about being a human being is you get to explore. You get to figure <laughs> out who are you. Explore. And... Explore. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and you know what? You don't have to land in any one thing. You can keep on changing because life is a fluid and dynamic thing that we should cherish and celebrate. <laughs> we don't want to freeze it in place as it were <laughs> and make it inert <laughs> yeah I, I brought it back around the immobilizer who wrote this one earl cress and he did the teleplay for ultimate doom part two but he had some help on that one so this is his first episode on his own wow i remember watching this one as a child and i remember it affecting me in a lot of ways and it's funny as I look back at it now because we're like there's a lot of talk about Iron Heights age in this episode, mm-hmm. which on paper I would say like that's not going to be very appealing to a child, you know. But I really responded to this because like I, I'd say like my ten thousand foot up view of this thing is like this is a story about a character who makes a mistake and can't get over the fact that his choices and his like success or failure has consequences that go beyond he himself, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what I do matters. This is for real. And that's scary, so I'm going to punch out, right? Like, that... Do you remember what grade you were in when you started getting homework when you were a kid? Hmm. Maybe third? Something like that? It was third grade for me as well. And I remember Mr. Norton looking at us and saying, you're not little kids anymore, it's time for you to start having some more responsibility and you're going to have homework now. You're going to have work that you take home to do. And I remember when he was saying that, I'm like, no, oh, wait a minute. I'm still a kid. I'm a little <laughs> kid. You, you can't ask me to actually like suffer the consequences of anything. I can't be held accountable for anything. I'm a child, you know, <laughs> obviously didn't say it in those words, but I remember that feeling of like, what, what are you talking about? Like, there's the, and, and so I think this episode, which, would have aired when I was in fifth grade. It rang true in a lot of ways, mm. despite even though they're talking about a character who is like feels like he's aging out of his office. Any ten thousand foot up views for you? I also noticed this episode is kind of light on Decepticon activity. It certainly is. I don't remember any specific memories of watching it when I was a kid either. Mm. I mean, I'm sure I did, but it didn't really stick. Mm. It's funny, there's a lot of characters in this episode, and a lot of characters get lines, but as I watched it all the way through again, I just remember thinking, like, yeah, I I have a feeling Hoover's not going to have, like, a lot of praise for this one, just because the Decepticons really don't do much except be bad guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a little too generic when it just ends up like that. Yeah. There's some nice Starscream moments, though, coming up. Well, at least, at least, like, giving us a flavor of, oh, that's the Starscream we know. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so is it time to read the logline? What does IMDb say about this? All right. Wheeljack's new invention, the immobilizer, freezes anything that it's pointed at. Now Megatron wants it for his own. This is another kind of Transformers plot that we see here and there in in the series is where Wheeljack or somebody comes up with a device. And instead of Megatron building a solar needle or Mm -hmm. stealing an oil refiner, he's just like, I'm going to take that invention and use it against my enemies kind of thing. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Pretty typical. Yeah. And also, I think it has like the whole invention of the immobilizer is like a very kid logic y kind of invention, which we'll talk about when, we, when Wheeljack turns it on. But how does this one begin? Well, this show starts with a shot of the arc as we hear Wheeljack telling everyone to come in closer to have a look at his new invention. Now, knowing what we know of Wheeljack's inventions, I understand why no one wanted to get close. <laughs> Remember when he had the shock blast cannon or whatever it was, and it blew up in his hand? It literally blew up and knocked him to the ground. <laughs> yeah. So Wheeljack introduces the Wheeljack Instant Immobilizer, causing Gears to ask what it instantly immobilizes, or rather Cliffjumper asks, but it's with Gears' voice, and they're standing right next to each other. So maybe this is another case of Casey Kasem not being here. So I guess we'll see. Mm. And Wheeljack is doing this in this very, who knows who came up with the direction on this one, but he's doing like this very like striped jacket, like 1930 salesman kind of pitch. <laughs> like step right up everybody and you'll see the Wheeljack instant immobilizer. <laughs> and so when, when Gears asks for the demonstration, he's like doing it like it's like a street salesman demonstration. So to explain what his doohickey does, Wheeljack enlists the help of Hound, who projects a hologram of Laserbeak flying around the base, as Wheeljack continues his explanation. Mm -hmm. But just then, in walks Ironhide, who spots the realistic-looking hologram, and yells for everyone to take cover, and starts wildly firing at this faux Laserbeak. The Autobots all duck to avoid his laser blasts, which hit some stalactites along the ceiling. These stalactites manage to bury Wheeljack as Ironhide asks if he managed to hit Laserbeak. But Spike explains that it was only a hologram from Hound. Ironhide is apologetic and unearths Wheeljack from the rocks. As it turns out, Wheeljack is okay, but part of his device isn't. Are you okay, Wheeljack? Probably, but this polarizer is poked out. Oh, wing nuts. I can't believe I mistook a hologram for the real article. Now, it's been a while since we've heard mechanical exclamations like, Oh, wing nuts. And I'm glad to have them show up again. Wheeljack reassures Ironhide that everything's okay. He'll simply send Bumblebee into town to pick up a new polarizer. Remember Radio Shack? Remember <laughs> it? It was a thing. Yeah, so this is like the part that like really connects like what I was talking about earlier is this idea of like making an error and realizing that like your errors can have effects on the people around you is that Ironhide is it's clear he's blameless. Hound's holograms are so convincing that Starscream thought he murdered a bunch of Autobots <laughs> at one point, right? Mm -hmm. So it's only a sign of success that if Ironhide walked into the room, not knowing what was happening, seeing Laserbeak flying around, of course he's going to attack. That shows that he is alert and ready to help, mm -hmm. right? But because it causes this, you know, because of the misunderstanding, it causes this accident. Wheeljack gets buried. Wheeljack's fine, by the way, but he yep. still got buried by rock. And so like a child who makes a bad error, he instantly blames himself. You know, it's like, oh, my gosh. I just think that that is an interesting idea to consider for a moment is that they're taking the idea of somebody who is, is Ironhide getting a little dotty, you know, like, is it like mm. that? But then they're making it into a story where kids can identify with what it's like when you make mistakes. So again, the writers are always doing their level best. I think this is an interesting way to explore something that kids are going through. Yeah. So. But polarizer, I mean, I don't know nothing about no tools. But I don't think there's something called a polarizer that you can just pick up at the Home Depot. So for funsies, I went to homedepot.com, and I found a lot of sunglasses and electric cords that were polarized, but nothing that could do the polarizing. But okay, in this world, you can just pick up a polarizer, sure. Okay. This is. Can we put put another like like a little mark on the chalkboard for how polarity is like an important plot right. device in, <laughs> in, in Sunbow cartoons? <laughs> Got to reverse the polarity. I think that actually comes up later on in this episode. But yes, th this whole idea of like polarizing things is very important in the Sunbow universe. <laughs> if we're gonna go get a polarizer, who's gonna go get it? Well, Spike and Bumblebee head out to pick up the polarizer because they're always the go-to guys to go out together to pick something up. Mm -hmm. They always pick up the tacos on taco night. <laughs> so we change scenes and we find them at Home Depot? No. Lowe's? No. Walmart? No. They're at Robots Video Arcade. Oh my gosh. This is where this fantasy was born. <laughs> my fifth grade year. 
1985, this is almost all I thought about every day on the playground was <laughs> and like i remember kids would come up to me on the playground they're like hey are you okay do you want to you want to play you know they, they thought i was like sad and like depressed or like in trouble because i was like just leaning against the wall and honest and for true i was just fantasizing about playing video games with bumblebee this scene <laughs> this scene like like left an indelible mark on me <laughs> Now, surely they were playing something that we've all played before, like Centipede or Defender <laughs> or Xevious, right? No. Oh. Bumblebee is playing an arcade game called Robot Resource. <laughs> what? Yep. It's called Robot Resource, and no less than 23 people and Spike look on. <sighs> So are they trying to find the only polarizer in town at an arcade or something? Mm. <laughs> no, they're playing robot resource. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't look closely. Do we actually see what's on the screen, what he's actually doing in the game? Or is it just like you just see him in front of the cabinet? I think we can see a little bit of the screen and it's just sort of like Atari blocks and stuff. Okay. Well, that would have been, yeah, that would have been the graphics at the time. <laughs> It makes you wonder if anybody's actually made like a fan game called Robot Resource. <laughs> Surely somebody has. If not, somebody make it, please. <laughs> but so 23 people are watching the game. Yeah. Wow. Because, uh, yeah, Bumblebee's playing the game and he's winning. The crowd is like muttering about what a high score he's getting. Right? Mm -hmm. He knows how to use his robot resources. <laughs> okay. So. So then one of the onlookers asks Spike. Excuse me, may I cut in? Uh, you'll have to wait your turn. I... I... I saw you come in with that cute Autobot. Could you introduce me to him? You want to meet him? Oh, yeah, sure. Bumblebee, this is, uh, somebody named... Carly! It's a pleasure to meet you, Bumblebee. Uh, Bumblebee, remember Wheeljack's polarizer? We should have been back with it hours ago. Well, I, I hope to see you again, Carly. Now, Jersey, when were you planning on revealing that you wrote this episode and Carly <laughs> is just your self-inserted Mary Sue character waiting to meet the cute Autobot? Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I wonder if all this time, like, I've just been play acting Carly my entire life. <laughs> They say, well, what is it? Like, you are who you were when kind of thing. Like, at 11 is, like, where, like, you really start to crystallize who you who are you going to become. I saw this episode when I was 11 years old, and I wonder if I just imprinted on her. <laughs> and, like, this is going to be, this is my direction. Except when we find out, like, more of Carly's more bravery and intelligence. I'm like, well, I, I didn't hit those bars. <laughs> but you got but the long blonde hair down. I got the long blonde hair and the attraction to Bumblebee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but as a kid i do remember this because again this episode had like an impact on me and i remember like crossing my arms going like ah her name's carly because she's friends with the autobots <laughs> we did the camera's like i got it i got the joke <laughs> you writers are very clever <laughs> well speaking of the writing what happens uh -huh. to humans making the autobots better Spike says they should have been back with the polarizer hours ago, and they've been yeah. they've been wasting all their time in this arcade. Poor Wheeljack just wants to show off, and these bozos are playing robot resource. Defend the humans. Well, okay, it's Spike who says we have to go. So my take on the scene is it was Bumblebee who said, like, well, we can stop and play a game. And, and Spike's like, oh, come on, we, we really should. We said we would, and let's, let's, let's be good to our word. And Bumblebee's like, one game. Spike didn't realize Bumblebee is so good with his robot resources <laughs> that on one quarter he's been there for hours, right? And that's why there's a lot of the 23 people. They're all waiting for their chance to play robot resource. But yes, this continues to support my hypothesis that the writers, intentionally or not, were writing a series where the Autobots always make better choices because of the humans. That's mm. why they're friends with the humans. Case in point. I'll allow it. All right. Thank you. So Bumblebee and Spike then take off, and we see this Jersey character, I mean Carly, <laughs> jump in a red convertible and peel out after them. <laughs> Now, spoiler alert, Jersey, I mean, Carly, is going to become a recurring character. She's a blonde teenage girl voiced by Arlene Bannis. Mm. She's known primarily for small roles and guest spots on lots of 1980s dramas like Dynasty and Falcon Crest. Oh, really? Just I had a lot no of idea. tiny little roles. Wow. I, I you know... I wouldn't be against marrying Spike. So maybe, yes, maybe, maybe she is my self-insert fanfic character. 
<laughs> Spike's pretty great. A lifetime with him? I wouldn't be again it. So, wow. You have never proposed this hypothesis to me before, Hoover. Mm-mm. In all our years of talking about this television series, you never made the connection that Carly was my self-insert fanfic. No, I never even really thought that much of Carly until re-watching this episode. I was surprised how much I liked her. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, let's keep going. <laughs> So we cut back to Bumblebee, and now he's swerving in and out of traffic trying to hurry home, and Spike is just relaxing in the passenger side, not a care in the world, when suddenly a police car turns on its siren and gets behind them. Now the cop cuts them off, and they come to a halt. Spike gets out and asks, what's wrong? And the cop, played by a very ungruff sounding John Stevenson, who plays Thundercracker usually, starts to give Spike a lot of guff for driving underage. But Bumblebee transforms and explains that Spike wasn't the one driving. <laughs> he gets up and he's like, we Autobots can turn to cars and other things. <laughs> meanwhile, while he's talking, we see something else. We pull back to see Ravage just watching this whole exchange. He's like sitting in a, like, a bunch of garbage, right? Like in an alleyway. <laughs> just, what is Ravage doing? What is he... It's not, I mean, I know that Laserbeak prowls about to, like, spy on Autobots, but I'm not used to, like, seeing Ravage just hiding out. Mm-hmm. So it makes me wonder if he was on his own thing that day, and it was just, like, luck would have it that he looks up and Bumblebee's there. I don't know. I think it was probably intentional to plant that camera, but... Uh... Oh, yeah, because Ravage has got a specific thing to do in a second here. You're right. So as Bumblebee is still trying to explain things to the cop, Ravage leaps and pounces onto Bumblebee. Spike is momentarily startled, but quickly asks the officer if he has any jumper cables. He takes them, hooks them up to the patrol car, and clamps the other end down on Ravage, giving him a huge shock and sending him running off. Okay, again, Spike, awesome, because, like, your, your best friend gets attacked by a giant jaguar. A metal mm-hmm. jaguar, too, right? Like, how, how much do you think Ravage weighs? Like, what, like 800, 900 mm. pounds? I don't know, probably not that much, but he's no featherweight, that's for sure. Yeah, but... So what do you do, right? Like, if it was me, I'd be standing there going, humming, humming, humming. Right. I wouldn't know yeah. what to do. Spike's like, he turns to the cop. He turns to the policeman, the grown-up. Spike's like, he's under 16. He's not old enough to drive yet. We know that much. And he's like, hey, do you got jumper cables? Great. And he opens up the hood of the policeman's yeah. car while the policeman's just standing there looking, you know, like, what are you doing? And, and then he he's able to, like, negotiate his way up these two fighting Transformers and get the cl- clamps onto Ravage's, quote-unquote, ears. <laughs> Why does that hurt Ravage? I don't know. It's weird. Electricity works in a weird way in the Transformers world. <laughs> sometimes it could be used to make energy. Sometimes it hurts them. I guess I guess certain foods could hurt us if, if used <laughs> on our bodies inappropriately. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> anyway. Well, that was very quick thinking on Spike's behalf. And I mm. think that's another hint that young Jersey wrote this episode. Since Jersey walked into an electric fence as a child, he knew he could use an electric shock in the script. That's why Spike was able to think of it so fast. You're right. <laughs> wow. I am really enjoying this fan theory. <laughs> this might be my favorite episode of the podcast. <laughs> well, Bumblebee uh. thanks Spike for the quick thinking, and the police officer lets them off with a warning about obeying the speed limit. But now we see that there's some kind of device stuck to Bumblebee's side. Yeah, during their tussle, Ravage like takes a little paw and like it mm-hmm. sticks this what looks like a it looks like a camera lens, but it's like it's big enough that like Bumblebee's arm should hit it, but it needs to be big enough that we the viewers actually see what it is too, <laughs> right? It's clearly a camera. And one scene transition later, Bumblebee's driving back into the arc and Spike gets out and hands Wheeljack the polarizer, causing him to retort It's about time. Mm -hmm. Spike tries to blame their lateness on meeting Carly, though it clearly wasn't her fault at all. But Wheeljack (laughs) isn't listening. He calls everyone back for a redo of his demonstration. He begins to explain what it does and how they can use it against the Decepticons. They do a close-up on Bumblebee and we see that that device that Ravage attached to him is a camera. Clearly, Megatron is going to get the hilarious antics of the Autobots on tape and send them into America's Funniest Home Videos. (laughs) Yes, when Trailbreaker walks the room and slips and falls and hits his back and can't breathe. (laughs) And then the part when, like, Gears accidentally electrocutes himself while repairing his part of Teletran 1. Yeah, and the, the part when Wind Charger gets his head stuck in a thing and almost gets it crushed by a thing, and everybody's trying to pull him out frantically. It's always about like some kind of horrendous injury that almost <laughs> happens to somebody or does happen to somebody, and then we all laugh because pain is funny when it's somebody else's pain. 
And Megatron's going to take the winnings and buy energy <laughs> legitimately. <laughs> They never did that in this series. There isn't an episode where Megatron like tries to amass wealth. That's an interesting idea, right? Mm. Like, what if he actually like got like caught onto the idea that oh, wait a minute, these humans, especially these ones in this land where we live, they're like they're crazy capitalists. What if we like bought into their system? And hey, there's these two twins who live in this building that's shaped like an E. <laughs> you know, I am Megatron, leader of the Decepticons. You look like something the cat declined to drag in. Earth germ. That would be an interesting crossover. But anyway, speaking of the Decepticons. We cut to them, and they're watching the Autobots on their big screen in their headquarters. Starscream suggests that they use Wheeljack's immobilizer on the Autobots, and Megatron actually agrees that that's a sound plan. And now that Ravage planted that camera on Bumblebee, They'll always know where they are. Quick art note. I was actually really happy to see that when we see the, the image on the screen that the Decepticons are watching, it's clearly shot from Bumblebee's vantage point. Mm. Like we're down below Optimus's elbow looking up at him and Wheeljack, which two things. One, super cool to see the world through Bumblebee's eyes. But two, it's like in a show where there's been so many episodes where Megatron turns on the TV screen and we just see Starscream flying. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like the camera can be anywhere when it comes to the Decepticons view screen. But this time they're actually maintaining a little bit of consistency in because they, they didn't have to do that. They could have just shot it from any angle. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's neat that they paid attention to that. Big thumbs up. I also appreciated that when they were on screen, it actually was drawn like a screen. Like, so many times, they're just drawn, like, completely three-dimensionally, mm -hmm. no matter the perspective that we're seeing the screen at. And right, It just looks right. wrong. Yeah, like, when you look at a television screen from an angle, there's going to be some distortion of the image. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, Sunbow shows sometimes observe that that, that <laughs> uh, effect, but sometimes they don't really, they play it fast and loose, right? Like, yeah, we're looking up at the screen, but it's like, it's as if we're looking straight on at the shot, and it shouldn't be that way. So, yeah, mm -hmm. good catch on that, too. So they're going to watch Bumblebee anytime they want, right? Yeah, how convenient. They'll be able to watch Bumblebee play video games at the arcade and see all the times he <laughs> speeds in late and gets yelled at by Gears. <laughs> that seems like that would be in a modern Transformers show. <laughs> Megatron would like be like rubbing his hands together going like, ah, we'll see all everything that they do. And it's like, oh, yeah, be careful what you wish for, Megatron. <laughs> Here's Bumblebee reading a magazine for three hours. Oh, my gosh. You read it twice. Put it down. <laughs> Do something else. <laughs> oh, he's writing in his diary. Oh, no. <laughs> well, we cut back to Autobot HQ, where Prime suggests that they test the immobilizer under safe conditions, and he orders everyone to transform. And we proceed to get some of the weirdest transforming <laughs> shots I've ever seen. We really do. The animation in this episode isn't bad, in my opinion, but it certainly is not great either. And all these transformation shots concentrate on weird body parts, like we see Bronze <laughs> arms retract into his body, <laughs> Gears' his feet fold back, and it's all accurate and on model, I'd say, but it's just concentrating on weird parts of everyone. There's one shot of Jazz sort of like descending into car mode, and you see like this weird business going on with his upper arms folding in underneath him. It looks really weird. Yeah. But thankfully, the traditional and most used prime transformation scene is used, which makes things <laughs> comfortable again. I'm always glad to see that uh, bit of stock footage. It is a great piece of animation. is worth repeating again and again. And that is a lovely piece of animation, mm -hmm. for sure. So the Autobots head out to the woods to do a test of the immobilizer, assigning Ironhide the job of keeping an eye on potential Decepticon ambushes. Mm-hmm. Now, Wheeljack starts up the device, and a little radar dish on the top fires a blast at the nearby rushing river, freezing it in its tracks. The whole river just freezes. It, like, turns gray, too. Yeah. Wheeljack celebrates his success, but Jazz isn't so sure. He tries to hop in the river, only to crash down on its hard surface rather than splash into it. Can it be a Wheeljack device works? <laughs> So Wheeljack explains. Right now, that water is hotter than any substance we know. Not harder than my hydraulic knuckles. I take that back. 
So that was Braun trying to smash through the water, but not even he could punch through it. And it's a nice shot, too, because we see Braun th- like as if we're in the river looking out at him. So he punches the screen, but he's, we see that he's punching the river itself. Mm-hmm. Also, did we ever describe what the immobilizer looks like? Just a little bit. It's got a little radar dish on top. And it's kind of like a, a gold fluoro dairy. Oh, how would you describe it? It's like half of an egg. Think of like if you yeah. took like an egg, turned it so that the, the narrow part points to the ground, cut off the round part of the top, put a satellite dish on top of it, and have three legs that can extend out and touch the ground, become a tripod. But when mm-hmm. it activates, the legs retract into the device, and it's got like these little spinning balls at the tip, at the very bottom of the device that where it's like hovering on the ground. And it sort of just like levitates there and the satellite dish moves around and whatever it shoots with that beam, that's what becomes immobilized in the case of this river. So, yeah. and Spike evidently wants to get a closer look at it to see what I'm talking about. Yeah, Spike runs up to check it out, but he's confused by a little device on the ground he accidentally stepped on. He inspects it and it seems it's the immobilizer's remote control. Right away, the immobilizer starts turning towards Spike. Wheeljack sees this and leaps into action, shoving Spike out of the way of the immobilizer's blast. Except the blast hits Wheeljack, who is immobilized. And we can tell because he has turned gray. Yep. So this device, according to Wheeljack, freezes the molecules of things. Like, it stops them from moving. Mm -hmm. Which... Actually, and he says, like, oh, that, that heart, the water's harder than any substance we know. I mean, and, and in truth, I don't think there's such a thing as, like, I, was it abs- I think you have to freeze something to absolute zero to get molecules to stop moving. But otherwise, molecules are always moving. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> I remember that description, like, checked out with me as an 11-year-old. Like, well, that's the way it would work. <laughs> Never mind the fact that when he froze the river, what happened to all the other water that went into the river? Where the like the lakes and tributaries and things that go in and to feed the river, did they all freeze too? Did all the water in <laughs> right. the world suddenly stop? <laughs> Was there somebody a swimming pool who suddenly died? Because, <laughs> you know, I don't know, but it's a kid's show, so we'll just accept it. <laughs> it's a cool looking pose, too, that the, they got Wheeljack in when he's thrusting Spike aside. It's like when they show, like, oh, Wheeljack's been immobilized, and we look at him again. It's it's a neat looking pose. This is another episode where I feel like the characters are, for the most part, pretty on model. Mm-hmm. And the shots are all really nicely constructed, so that any weakness in the animation, I feel like... Actually, I would say the animation is pretty good. This is like Robotech-level animation for the most part in this one. But... It's a good looking episode, and this is a great looking shot. Except for those weird transforming shots. Yeah, yeah. They're you're right. so out of place. It's weird. <laughs> they are really weird. We're progressing towards the part of the series where the transformations just start turning into them, just like blurring into their yeah. vehicle mode. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get worse, kids. <laughs> But like I like what Ratchet does when he walks up to him. He's like, Wheeljack's been immobilized. He grabs his head and starts trying to turn it. <laughs> <laughs> So Ratchet's inspecting Wheeljack, and he points out that Wheeljack hadn't told him yet how to undo the immobilizer's effects. So Prime is unsure what they should do, but they have to make sure such a powerful weapon doesn't fall into Decepticon hands. (laughs) And now we focus in on the stowaway camera on Bumblebee's side. By the way, Optimus saying, I don't know what to do Mm -hmm. right now. How cool is that? How cool is that that a leader could look at his troops and say, you know what? I don't know what to do right now. I don't have an answer for everything immediately. Let's go home and think about it. All I know is this. Mm -hmm. That is scary. Keep it out of the bad guy's hands. It just backs up my theory that Prime doesn't have the Matrix yet. Prime doesn't know anything. (laughs) (laughs) I like our different takes on this. (laughs) You always default to Prime being like a beleaguered parent. (laughs) It's like, I don't know. But whereas I'm thinking like, oh, that's good leadership. Actually admit that you don't know and that the team should work together to come up with a solution. But yeah, the scene ends with us focusing in on that camera Mm -hmm. to remind us that the Decepticons are watching while this is happening, right? Yeah. Now, me being me, I have to wonder if this was a role originally intended for Reflector that they altered. I don't know Mm. if Ravage was supposed to like, (laughs) <laughs> stick reflector to bumblebee <laughs> i don't know that would have been good i mean reflector had never really been portrayed as capturing video before either but i could see them just going with that so i don't know yeah. it's just a possibility 
Yeah. So now we cut to Ironhide, guarding the area, who thinks he's spotted a Decepticon spy in the forest. All he's really seen is a shadow moving around, but he shoots at the tallest tree in the forest, which falls over onto the ground. Wait, Violence Against Trees? Jersey couldn't have written this episode. That part made me, oh, I, I, was, I was with this episode all the way until that. And I was like, what are you doing, Ironhide? Come on. <laughs> I mean, like, let's, suppose it, let's suppose it was the Decepticon, first of all. That top of a tree, is that going to stop Soundwave from doing something? No. So th- you kill the tree for nothing. Two, if it's not a Decepticon, then it's somebody who could get hurt by that tree <laughs> right. falling on top of them. So bad move, Ironhide, all around. <laughs> and it turns out it wasn't a Decepticon at all. It was Jersey. I mean, Carly. (laughs) Who could have easily been crushed by this tree. Tisk, tisk. That's right. Ironhide tells her that civilians aren't allowed in the area. And she retorts that she just wanted to watch because she thinks all the Autobots are totally incredible. Well, they are. (laughs) Just then, Ironhide hears laser fire and excuses himself to go tend to what sounds like a battle brewing. He arrives too late, and he sees the Decepticons have the Autobots surrounded. Megatron says he'll take the Immobilizer now, if you please. And Ironhide laments that the Autobots' ambush is all his fault. And this self-loathing leads us to our first commercial break. Yeah, it ends with Ironhide We're looking right at his face as he's saying, the Autobots got captured because I wasn't attending to my post. This is all my fault. And he's like looking down with mm-hmm. shame. And I like how the Decepticons are like surrounding the Autobots are like four feet away from everybody. You know, it's, it's almost like the Autobots were all just gathered on the river and the Decepticons jumped out like a surprise party. I mean, yeah. that's what it looks like, the shot. But yeah, so what a way to end. Again, we're not ending in what we've gotten in the past where a, a character is pointing a gun at the camera or at another character, you know, like prepare for oblivion with I mean, roll for it. Mm. Or you must be destroyed and fire in the sky. Now it's ending in this like abstract way where it's like, okay, well, the Autobots are in immediate peril but we're focusing on the guy who's heartbroken because he's blaming himself yep. for their immediate peril yeah so so since we're being so down on ourselves i think i'm gonna drown my sorrows in a bowl of gi joe action star cereal introducing gi joe action stars brand cereal a delicious part of this complete breakfast crunchy stars that taste great just be careful when you follow Duke out the window that you're wearing a parachute or a jetpack because it's a long way down out your front door. I'm always wearing a jetpack. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. <laughs> then I thought maybe we could lift our spirits with a different kind of battling robots. How about the Stariors? Mm, they got saws in their chests. In their chests. <laughs> You can imagine in the future, giant robot-controlled warriors will protect the planet Earth. And while I'm sampling other brands of robot toys, how about I switch on Charger Tron robots like you've never seen? That is like the most like 80s jingle cranked out in 15 minutes. <laughs> We, we got to come up with a jingle for this new toy line. Okay, well, let me turn on the TV for a few seconds. Okay, I got it. I got it. What the kids are into. <laughs> Buddy L trying to ride that Hasbro Tonka wave. Switch on Charger Tron. Oh, my goodness. Can we please get back to the show now? Because I want to find out how sad Ironhide is and how I, I mean, Carly can make him feel better. <laughs> we return to Megatron demanding the device with Trailbreaker retorting. Try and take it, Mega Turkey! So be it! Fire! And a huge firefight breaks out, only Trailbreaker uses his force field to protect them from the blasts. Hey, Trailbreaker! <laughs> Not only does he talk and do stuff in this episode, but yes, you have that amazing force field. So, like, in close quarters combat, this makes perfect sense. Because, like... It was a pretty good cliffhanger to end on, right? It's Mm -hmm. like they're surrounded by the Decepticons, and they're all holding their guns at them. What are they going to do? Well, Trailbreaker buys them some time. Can I also make a note of something else that I don't think we've talked about uh, about this show in the past is, and I thought about it just because I was looking at the shot of Trailbreaker when he's like leaning in and like sort of like kind of coming in with one leg and leaning on his knee saying like, try to take it, Mega Turkey. Mm-hmm. his face is the same color as the rest of his eyes. He's got like an all black Autobot. And then you've got Mirage who has a blue face and we don't get a whole lot of variation in the color of the Transformers faces. I don't think that's necessarily an important thing to hang on for too long, but for the most part, most of the Transformers have gray faces. 
Bumblebee mm-hmm. has a white face, mm-hmm. but but yeah, if you name it, yeah, even Ratchet has a gray face. So it just it stands out to me that like we don't get that whole lot after this either. I think like most of the Autobots we meet in this season, the new ones are going to come out, all have the gray faces. So it's just representing the artists in this room. Mm-hmm. I think it's an interesting idea that I wish we could have gotten more color and style variation in these early Transformers. Mm. Gray is definitely sort of the default color. Why couldn't they have other colors? Doesn't mean they can have all sorts of paint jobs. Anyway, so he uses this force shield. And here we return to form a little bit here. Megatron had a plan. So somebody's got notes. And that somebody is Starscream. We could have wiped them out. But you had to have this ridiculous immobilizer. And then Starscream takes off, trying to go above the Autobots' projected force field. But Sideswipe has another idea. He shoots into the air, too, and knocks Starscream off course, but this time doesn't make him say uncle. (laughs) So the Autobots attack back, and the Decepticons literally duck behind trees to avoid the laser fire. So there's just these convenient, really thick trees that the Decepticons can peer out the side of. Yeah, yeah, these these are very, very, they are in the Redwood Forest, I guess, in Northern (laughs) California. Because, yeah, these, these trees are gigantic. And Skywarp retracts his hand and fires a, quote, bouncer bomb from it at the Autobots. Okay, we've never seen that before. Guess Skywarp has been buying some upgrades from Lockdown. Yeah. Name is Lockdown. I'm what you call a bounty hunter. Decepticons pay real good for info, battle plans, access codes. It hits a tree and then knocks Jazz over before it bounces over to another target. Spike runs up to Ironhide, finding Carly with him. Spike wants to know what she's doing here, but now the bomb's coming their way, and the three of them narrowly avoid a tree falling on them. This bomb isn't much of a bomb. It's more like a a rocket that just, like, instead of exploding upon contact, just ricochets, like, all over the place. Yeah, and it seems to make things explode when it hits, but the bomb itself doesn't explode, so it's... (laughs) (laughs) So we need to come up with a name like a category name for when these kind of things start happening mm. in Transformers. Like when Megatron had that gun that could make rocks right. bounce around and yeah. hit people in the face. You know, it's like whenever there's like a weird weapon that just, I mean, at the very least, I'll hand it to Skywarp. He named it. He said what it was. Yeah. So it wasn't just like, okay, there's a missile bouncing off of everything. But yeah, it's a weird little piece of technology that there is no explanation of where it came from or why he waited till now to use it. Yep. So this crazy bomb is just ricocheting off everything and is now bounced back towards the Decepticons. Megatron tries to expedite the fight, so he transforms and lands in Soundwave's hand, who fires at another tree, which lands on Prime. Mm. And the immobilizer falls from Prime's hand and skids to a stop near the three Seekers. Ironhide sees this and attempts to retrieve it, but one shot from Megatron in gun mode sends Ironhide down to the ground. Starscream then picks up the immobilizer, but Ironhide shoots some brown gravy at him from his retracted hand. <laughs> Heinz homestyle gravy, so close to homemade. Yeah, it really does look like that, too. <laughs> Put this on your mashed potatoes, Starscream. <laughs> Ugh, I hate gravy. <laughs> then Megatron orders a retreat, which Starscream objects to. But this gravy is more like glue and prevents him from taking off as the immobilizer slips from his hands. Megatron retrieves it and cackles with glee. This is another thing that I feel like we need to keep track of in this series is like there's a handful of times where Megatron tells Starscream to retreat and Starscream says some variation of Decepticons never retreat. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well... It's funny you should say that, because <laughs> we're, we're 22 episodes in now. <laughs> I feel like I don't have to look very far to find some fact-checking on that statement, but it's just weird that he says it, you know? But anyway, but yes, Megatron picks up the immobilizer, and he is very happy. And now we get some clown time, where a suddenly unstuck Starscream is walking around, <laughs> bumping into trees over and over. My telemeter has been damaged! <laughs> what did you think of this because like Starscream's like he's just like walk he's walking around with his arms in front of him like like he's like got a blindfold on but he doesn't have a blindfold on and he's literally bouncing into trees and then like he's bouncing away from them uh was not a fan <laughs> i mean i liked when 
you know, Megatron lost his equilibrium that one time. I mean, I mm-hmm. and I understand that, you know, these are essentially machines and mm-hmm. they can have telemetry and all that sort of thing. I don't mind that. It's just I don't like how it was being played. It's like we just needed to like shove in a quick joke there or something. Yeah, it it, it comes in really fast. Like mm-hmm. just like three seconds ago he was stuck in that brown gravy. Drops the the mobilizer. Megatron's like, ah, I got it. Then it's like back to Starscream bouncing around the woods. <laughs> yeah. I would have liked it more if they had taken a moment to show Thundercracker and Skywarp laughing at him. That would have been good. Then that that would have made it all a okay in my book. But... <laughs> yeah, it it feels like we get a lot of Decepticons in this, but we don't get a lot of Decepticon characterization in yeah. this. And I I think that's I mean there's an imp- an important feature of Sunbow cartoons, the good ones, the really good episodes, include some kind of character-driven humor. Humor that is based on what we love about the character in the first place. And just simply having Starscream bump into walls is not enough of a joke until you work in. Like if Rumble was there pointing at him and laughing, yeah. boom, the joke yeah. is sealed. Yep, exactly. Because what, what do we know about Rumble? He's a little turd who likes to <laughs> pick fights with the bigger guys, you know? <laughs> But instead, we just get Prime telling Megatron that he's losing his warriors, and Megatron points out that warriors are expendable. <laughs> the important thing is that he gets what he deserves as he victoriously holds up the immobilizer. Yeah. But then we cut back to see that the Decepticons are standing on the immobilized river, which suddenly changes back to liquid form, causing all the Decepticons to splash down and drift away with the tide. <laughs> a river's usually deep enough for a 20-foot robot to fall down into. I don't know about that. I would have to check a map of the Redwood Forest in Northern California, like Big Sur. <laughs> I, there might be. There might be. But as a child, I loved this, and I continue to love it as an adult, as the Decepticons fall into the river. Because like I said, Megatron's just like, ah, the important things, I get what I deserve, and I always do. Mm-hmm. And then the river turns to water again, and they all fall down. They all scream as they fall into the water. They get it. And they they it, got what they deserve. <laughs> <laughs> understand kids well but that's just it is that the writers are like well just in case they didn't get the joke trailbreaker leads it again it's like mm-hmm. you certainly deserve that yeah, <laughs> yeah the autobots and, all have a good laugh at the decepticons expense i know that the really right thing would be to not laugh and mock the people who are your enemies because treating them like others and like monsters is tantamount to like joining them and becoming monsters i get that okay storm shadow <laughs> Noble enemies should not be treated in this fashion. At the same time, <laughs> there's something that is so cathartic and relieving about, like even He-Man calls Skeletor a bonehead, right? It's like mm-hmm. it's like he's he's as good as it gets. So it's like I I love it when the Autobots laugh at the Decepticons except for in the end of Countdown to Extinction. That's the only time where I'm like, guys, that wasn't a laughing matter. Mm-hmm. This is one of many times where like, when the, the heroes get a good laugh at the expense of the really scary bad guys who had something humiliating happen to them. You know, it's like when you have a monster like Megatron who's that scary, and then like, you know, he slips and falls on something, that's great. That's good comedy. So anyway, I like it. <laughs> I'm not expecting you to agree with me, but I like it a lot. <laughs> well, the Decepticons climb, not fly, out of the <laughs> river downstream. And Megatron swears revenge, but right now Prime wants to get the immobilized Wheeljack back home so they can try their hand at fixing him or just hope he returns to normal as the river did. Mm. So Carly asks to accompany them and follows them back to the Ark in her car. Yeah, she says, can I come too? And they're like, yeah, sure. (laughs) Come on over. Once home, Ratchet is fixing up Ironhide as he takes the blame for the Decepticon attack. Ratchet tries to insist that it wasn't his fault, and Prime tries to convince Ironhide. Nah, I'm too old to be useful anymore. I don't believe that, Ironhide. But I do. I'm retired from active service, Prime. Very well, if you feel that strongly about it. But we shall miss you, Ironhide, old friend. I miss you already. What? What kind of rinky-dink, half-butted attempt at convincing someone of their worth was that? <laughs> That's terrible leadership. Ah. <sighs> If my manager ever said that to me, I'd think, oh, clearly he's not fighting any to win me back, so he must not want me back too badly. 
This only reaffirms my thought that Optimus does not have the Matrix yet, oh. because he's not even wise enough to use more than one sentence to convince someone to stay on the job. Bad form, Optimus. Pun intended. Disagree. Disagree. Because this is pure self-pity at work. Ironhide is feeling sorry for himself. And also, here's the problem with self-pity. is like, Ironhide's basically saying, like, we all failed because of me. In other words, I am the most important member of this team because if I fail, you all die. That's how that's how critical I am to everything. There's like a kind of weird, I wouldn't say narcissism, but like a self-involvement that's involved with that kind of self-pity. And Optimus knows that Ironhide's got to walk it off. He's better than this. I'm going to say, hey, look, we, we love you. You're a member of this team. You're a great warrior. We're going to miss you if you leave. I miss you already. He says that to himself, right? I miss you already. I, I miss you already because this isn't who you are, Ironhide. You are not this self-pitying guy. Whatever is going on in your head, you gotta, we got to work it out. Well, that's exactly know? what I'm saying. That, that's yeah. what Optimus should be saying instead of, okay, bye, we'll see you later. <laughs> He's saying, I respect you enough that if you tell me that's what you want, then that's what you're going to get. You but are we really will reading miss you. into that. I, I know I am. <laughs> Prime says, very well, if you feel that strongly about it, but we shall miss you, Ironhide, old friend. <laughs> it's like, no, that is this, too happy and beamy. And... This argument is exactly what this podcast is all about. <laughs> <laughs> it, we, we just This is a microcosm of why we're doing this thing. Because, yes, we both have such different interpretations of the very same moment. Because I, I read it as he's he's respecting Ironhide to like work this out for himself. It's something he's got to figure out on his own. Because I, when you're in that kind of level of self pity, there's no reason, logic, or evidence I can use to pull you out of it. You got to work that stuff out, buddy. You know, what? I'm gonna respect you. This is what you told me. But we're gonna miss. We will miss you. He says it. We will miss mm -hmm. you, my friend. Right? Yeah. And if he says that after what you just said, that'd be fine. But he doesn't. <laughs> So Prime is a jerk. I win. No, Prime's a great leader. <laughs> anyway. Thumb, thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> We're the Siskel and Ebert of Transformers Podcast. Ah, there's another reference that will land with a thud. All right, so, all right, moving on. We cut to Spike and Carly as she tries to convince Ironhide that it wasn't his fault, and she's trying way harder to stop him from leaving than Prime did. <laughs> and she convinces him to give her a tour of headquarters to make him feel useful. Yeah, she's like, oh, please, just just think about it. And while you're thinking about it, it, it like her tone changes that way, too. She's like, oh, while you're thinking about it, you can give me a tour of the place. That'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, she's she's emotionally intelligent. That's mm -hmm. how I would describe Carly. Yeah. So, yes. And I really like this snub on Spike, who clearly has the hots for her. I mean, she could have said, hey, Spike, you know, you want to show me around the base? Nope. She goes straight <laughs> to an Autobot. She clearly is way more interested in Autobots than a 15-year-old blue-collar hard hat enthusiast. <laughs> but to be fair, Spike has not worn a hard hat at all in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like he's, he keeps putting it on whenever she walks through. He's like, eh -em! you know, adjusts it. Hello. I'm important. I have a job. <laughs> I have a job. <laughs> have you seen any Autobots around? I, I want to talk to them. <laughs> well, to be fair, yeah. I mean... <laughs> I think Spike's the greatest, but yeah, if I was if I was a fifteen, sixteen year old kid, that's all I'd be interested interested in is. Uh, and yeah, I, I think this is the episode that made Ironhide one of my favorite Transformers of all. And that is the more and more I think about this one, yeah, so I can see that. So Ironhide's walking around the base, and we get to the scene where and I love this line so much. It's a little thing, but it just it communicates why. I like the Autobots. Why I prefer them, not just because they're on the side of right, because the way he says it, they're walking down this hallway filled with missiles. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's like racks and racks of missiles on the wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, you could, maybe you should describe the room first, then I'll talk about Ironhide. There's line. literally dozens of giant missiles that are like slightly smaller than Ironhide. They're like bumblebee sized missiles. Yes. And where in the world do they fire these missiles from? <laughs> I mean, they're so large, I can't imagine anyone but maybe Skyfire using them. Right. <laughs> if they fired all these missiles at the Decepticons, they could just wipe them out easily. There's literally, like, dozens of them. 
just like stored on a wall. But then Ironhide says, we'd rather not have this stuff around at all. No. But until the Decepticons change or we pacify them once and for all, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like he doesn't say until we wipe out the Decepticons, kill every last one of them, right. crush their faces with the heel of our boots. You know, he doesn't do it Al Capone. I want their house burned to the ground. <laughs> I want to pee on their ashes kind of thing. He says, like, until they change, I'm holding out. Maybe they'll change their minds. Maybe Megatron, a la one of the later Transformers series, will say, like, hey, you know what? I got a taste of what it feels like to be conquered. Not so fun. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that anymore, right? Or we pacify them. In other words, we find a way to make them not want to fight us, us anymore. Maybe we can come to some kind of agreement. Oh, my gosh. That's the essence of what good guys are. Good guys see compromise. Good guys believe in the best of other people. And I just love that the tired old warrior character says that aloud in this show, which is largely good and evil shooting at each other. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> putting in this line. But then Carly jumps on that line, right? She's like, somebody should pacify them. And their underwater headquarters. Weird yeah. line of dialogue, but it's there for a reason, right? <laughs> so then while we're on the tour, we see Carly step away from Ironhide and swipe something from a nearby shelf. What could it be? Well, it certainly wasn't those 40-foot-long missiles. <laughs> 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 but it was something that was in that room. So yeah, probably not good. Well, we transition to later in the arc, the immobilized wheeljack comes back to life. Thankfully, they hadn't just thrown him into the Dinobot cave yet. <laughs> that would have been like a, a mid-season one Optimus. What do we do with the Prime? I don't know. Put him in the closet. With all the other stuff that doesn't work. <laughs> and I love that Wheeljack comes to, the first thing he says is, Spike okay. Yeah. Ugh. See, they're always better because of Spike. Anyway, but yes, yeah, so... So Prime and Ironhide fill him in on what he missed, and that Megatron now has the immobilizer. He states that if they can figure out how to make the effect permanent, they're sunk. And Ironhide is there, and he's still on his self-pity kick, because he's like, Megatron got the immobilizer, and it's my fault! Don't forget! <laughs> Don't forget, it's my fault that that happened. Never mind, there was a whole bunch of other Autobots there who could also have prevented it from getting picked up, but I failed! Everybody look at me in my failure, please! You know, And then Wheeljack is like, I don't know about that. <laughs> It moves on. <laughs> but then, yeah, well, that, if Ironhide's there, then... Well, Spike asks Bumblebee if he's seen Carly, and they come to discover her car is gone, too. So Spike says that they'll have to look for her. Calm down, Spike. Jeez. Let a woman go where she wants to go. <laughs> <laughs> he's concerned about mm -hmm. her safety. He's concerned uh -huh. about his dating life is what he's concerned <laughs> about. But he claims that she was upset about Ironhide, and there's no telling what she'll do because of that. <laughs> well, actually, he might just have the hots for her. Okay. You know, many motivations can <laughs> inform our actions. <laughs> so then Bumblebee and Spike speed away. Meanwhile, Prime is convinced that the time to retrieve the immobilizer is now, so everyone else transforms and rolls out. In other words, there's nobody left at the base. Except for Ironhide, who's retired. Yeah. Well, then we cut to Carly in a boat, complete with scuba gear. And she says, I've got to make up for the danger I've caused Ironhide and the Autobots. And I will. And she puts on her scuba mask and dives underwater. And we see her swim down to Deceptitown under the sea. This girl's a problem solver, ready to leap into action at any moment. Mm. She's pretty great. We see her place a device on the side of the base, which we have to assume is that same thing that she swiped out of the armory. Mm -hmm. But inside, Soundwave has detected a human presence outside their headquarters. Carly begins to swim up to the surface as Soundwave ejects Laserbeak. And she comes up to the surface and tries to return to her boat, but Laserbeak attacks. She does a pretty great job of fending him off, honestly, but before she can get into the boat and get it started... He comes back and grabs her. She screams as Laserbeak flies back to headquarters as we enter our second commercial break. Now, Carly is super brave, and I think it's awesome that she's like, you know, feeling accountable. Like this is another, this is like sort of like a, a mirror of the of the main story, which is about Ironhide feeling accountability and his inability to live up to account for his actions, and now she's feeling accountable for him, right? Mm-hmm. 
So it's all of us dealing with the consequences of of mistakes and misunderstandings. But, mm, you know, going to the Decepticon base on your own, single human, even if you do have whatever that thing was that she has. Is that super bright, Carly? It's very brave. I don't know if it's the most well-informed thing to do because now, yes, we end with a pretty intense scream Mm -hmm. from her as she's being dragged away by Laserbeak. So, I don't know. I mean, brave, powerful girl in peril. How will we endure the next three minutes or so (laughs) waiting for the show to come back? Now, this episode has been the most girl-powerist episode of the Transformers so far. So, to celebrate that, I'm going to have some strawberry shortcake cereal. It's a very Mm. tasty part of this nutritious breakfast. New strawberry shortcake cereal. It's very delicious. Oh, it's fun to say berry. (laughs) And speaking of berry... (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to play with my Care Bears because every day can be a Care Bear day. Introducing three of the soft, cuddly Care Bears. Friend, tender heart, and cheer. Each sold separately. Every day can be a Care Bear day. Can I ask you real quick, because I was having this conversation with a cartoonist friend of mine as to what three Care Bears would comprise your personality? Oh, gosh. Grumpy Bear, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) So I got pegged. I asked my wife, and I said, which three would I be? And she was like, well, clearly Graham's Bear, Cheer Bear, and Tenderheart Bear. And I was like, oh, that actually kind of checks out. Yeah, checks out. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know that I know enough Care Bear names to identify others who would fill in the rest of my personality, but I don't know. You know, so take a stab well, at it. I would say lots of heart elephant, and then yes, definitely Grumpy Bear. <laughs> maybe, m- maybe. What? You're demoting me to a Care Bear cousin? That's not a demotion by any means. <laughs> do cousin, not. And, cousins are always a demotion. Oh, no way. Hey, we're running Play out heart. of bear names. So what do we do? Let's bring other animals into this. Oh, okay. Bring, Braveheart Lion was awesome. Oh my gosh. And then I would th- I would throw in a uh, Brightheart Raccoon. A little bit of Brightheart Raccoon in there too. Oh. So you get you get two cousins and Grumpy Bear. Well, oh wait, nope, I take it back. I'm going to take out Lots of Heart Elephant. I'm going to throw in Bedtime Bear. <laughs> okay, I can get behind that. <laughs> So, okay, well, now that we're done celebrating Care Bears, there's one more commercial to go before we get back to the show. What's it going to be? Well, let's wrap it up with the women of Robotech. Because oh. they're living a life of adventure, and so am I. The women of Robotech. It's Dana Sterling, daring Robotech squadron leader, battling the enemy on her hover cycle. Dear, look out! <laughs> but when the fighting's over, Dana has time for a workout. <laughs> then she goes to a fabulous party. Dana, you look so pretty. Isn't she neat? <sighs> when the fighting's over, Dana Sterling has time for a workout. Wait a minute, after the battle? You're still going to work? Dana, you are dedicated. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Never skips gym day. But you and I, we don't have time for a workout as we have to get back to our episode. And that has always been my excuse not to work out, that there's always a Transformers episode to get back to. (laughs) You know, you can watch it on the treadmill. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) Okay, so clearly we're going to get back to Decepticon Base and see what happened to Carly. Yes, please. Well, as we resume our tale, we see back at the Ark, Sparkplug yells for Ironhide to come see what Teletrans Sky Spy has found as the screen shows them Laserbeak carrying off Carly into Decepticon headquarters. See, this is what I was talking about earlier, is that they, whenever they turn on the monitor in the show, typically yep. we just see like a static horizontal shot of whatever it is we need to know. <laughs> and there it is. Now, Ironhide, still certain he's not up to snuff, says, uh, Spike will find her. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and this causes Sparkplug to retort that Spike can't take on the Decepticons alone, and the Ironhide is our only hope. Well, you know, they do say that like when you're feeling sad, helping somebody tends to uh, alleviate that depression and sadness. Mm-hmm. So this is Sparkplug showing his emotional intelligence. He's like, well, actually, Ironhide, we really don't need you, but we could really <laughs> use your help. Fingers <laughs> crossed behind his back. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we cut to Deceptitown under the sea where Laserbeak drops Carly at Megatron's feet. I saw her in the forest with the Autobots. Then she must be their friend. Now they will most certainly come to rescue her. 
and we shall be waiting. <laughs> this is a great looking scene. This mm-hmm. scene is really, it's, it's shot really well. And like when it cuts down to Carly looking up at Megatron and we see the size difference between her and him, like you mm-hmm. don't often get to see humans in relation to Megatron. Yeah. Um, we had like three episodes of Dr. Archiville and that was it. So I also really like that laser beak just flies in and just drops her off at Megatron's feet. Like, you know, the deal. <laughs> I don't need to explain anything. <laughs> That's true. That's and very true. I, lo- I love Megatron's uh, little bit of diction here. And who, pray tell, is this creature? Yeah. I will say, we haven't get, don't get a lot of characterization from a lot of the, the Decepticons of this one, but Megatron comes off as a little bit more sinister in these, these scenes in particular. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Megatron could very easily be a very bland villain, but mm-hmm. Frank Welker mm-hmm. takes that role and just transforms it into oh. something much more magical. <laughs> wow. Check and checkmate. <laughs> so now we cut back to Spike and Bumblebee driving down the road trying to figure out how to find Carly. <laughs> Good question. Because how <laughs> on the world could you expect to just find a girl in a city with no clues or anything? This is pre-iPhones. There's yeah. no... You know, like sharing your location with friends kind yep. of thing. <laughs> there's no, what, what was the app that people used to use? Foursquare, right? There's, just, there's no Foursquare yeah. at Decepticon headquarters. <laughs> oh, so, she checked in at the robot arcade. <laughs> right, right. It's like, no, this going to look for somebody in 1985 was a real challenge. Mm. And so this just goes to, I'm putting this under the column of Spike and Bumblebee's overwhelming bravery. Right? <laughs> Of course you would. <laughs> I put it in the category of Spike's overwhelming need for a girlfriend. <laughs> uh, so they're driving along looking for Carly and... And suddenly they see Skyfire above them. And we close up on Skyfire and we see Ironhide inside. And he jets down to meet up with Bumblebee. Mm. And Ironhide lets them know that Carly's been captured and the three head off for a rescue. Can I draw a red circle around this scene in red crayon and like basically hold it up to all the other Transformers writers on your behalf? Because it's like they took the time. Skyfire doesn't talk. There's no Greg Berger in this episode. Right? <laughs> but it's like they took the time to say, like, how did he get there? Skyfire took him. Look, mm-hmm. there he is. Bye, Skyfire. <laughs> he flies away. <laughs> and then uh, I just lands on the ground. It's like it's that simple. It's that simple. Solve all the problems. Make Hoover happy. Create consistency. It is a simple thing to show, but also it just points to how the Autobots just use Skyfire like an Uber, and they don't even treat him like a coherent being. Right. He's just he's just their ride. Oh. Well, I mean, again, let's go back to kids' point of view. Isn't that what parents were? <laughs> <laughs> Take me to the arcade. What? You're not going to pick me up at five? I told you five. Pick me up at five. <laughs> But yeah, so so Ironhide lands and like he he like doesn't even there's no preamble. He's just like Carly's been captured, yeah. you know. They, or I, I don't even think he says he doesn't even say her name. He's just like she's been captured by the Decepticons, <laughs> and like well we gotta go get her, you know. So they go head off to go save her, and that takes us to go back to Decepticon under the sea, where the bomb that Carly planted has finally gone off, blowing a giant hole in the side of the fortress, allowing water to rush in. Soundwave seals off that part of the base just in time as Megatron asks for a damage report. And it turns out the part of the base taking in water is the part where they placed the captured Carly. So Megatron, Skywarp, and Soundwave are able to watch through a window into Carly's cell as she fights against the rushing water. Once the water reaches the ceiling, Megatron declares the show over and to get back to work. This part is very... I feel like this is where we get right up to the edge of PG-13. Not because of any specific gore or suffering, but just because Megatron says, as the water's rushing in and she's fighting to stay on top of it, he's like, this should be very interesting. And he says it very, like, the sinister kind of like, I'm going to watch somebody suffer, and I'm clearly going to enjoy it. Yeah. And then we see her head, like, heading towards the ceiling as the water overtakes her, and then it cuts away really quick, so we don't see the water fully overtake her. But it cuts away to the window that Megatron's watching. We see the water overtake the window. Then Megatron says, all right, show's over, back to work. Mm -hmm. Cold, cold character, Megatron, in this one. But as I was watching, I was like, oof, this is rough. But then (laughs) 
my tension is quickly released because yeah. Ironhide like, just pops in. <laughs> yeah, the Decepticons look away, and Ironhide manages to burst in, grab Carly, and swim right out. Very quickly. And walking up to the beach, he sets Carly down, he points out his skill, and then he's clearly not too old to make a difference. Yeah, and he's like, oh, well, maybe you got a point there. <laughs> so then Bumblebee and Spike pulls up, and they ask Carly to hop in, and everyone's set to take off. But they look behind them, and now Ironhide's not following. Now we see Ironhide standing there all gray and frozen still. But the kids and Bumblebee don't get why <laughs> Ironhide's not moving and aren't concerned that he's suddenly all gray. So maybe the kids are colorblind? <laughs> Bumblebee figures out that Ironhide's been immobilized as soon as he transforms. So I think maybe it's just Spike and Carly that are colorblind. I, I'm chalking this up to the poetry of the storytelling. Is that the, the turning gray is just a visual signal to us, the viewers, to know what happened. Because otherwise it would just look like, well, they stopped animating them, right? <laughs> because like, I would assume that in the actual, like if this was a real life event, he would just stop moving. And then they would have to go back and go, why isn't he even following us? But here's another thing that's weird is like, he's like holding his hand up like he's waving. Mm -hmm. And this, even when I was a kid, this confused me. It's so like, they're like, oh, let's go back to headquarters. And then like, as Bumblebee transforms and starts driving away, we hear the immobilizer ray fire yeah. off and we see it hit Ironhide very briefly. But the pose Ironhide is in is, he's, is as if he's waving goodbye to them. Now, if he was in mid-transformation, that would make sense. He was going to go back to base with them. Why was he waving goodbye? It's a weird thing. And I kind of think it was just like a misunderstanding or an accident in the animation that yeah. led to that. Because there's no reason for him to stay there on the beach, right? I mean, you, I guess you could say that he's still sort of down on himself and he's not going to go back to headquarters. He's going to pit her around and... Yeah. Maybe talk himself into it or something. Uh, yeah, maybe I just need some time alone to think. You know, maybe that was it. And yeah, okay, there we go. That makes sense to me now. Thank you. You you solved the problem that has haunted me <laughs> since nineteen eighty five. Thank you. <laughs> uh Hoover explains it all yet again. <laughs> na 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 And then he, you throw the cape over your face and jump off the side of the building and then I look down to see where you went and you're just gone. <laughs> So Bumblebee is trying to figure out what's up with Ironhide, and he figures out that he's been immobilized, and then we hear a familiar laugh from Rumble, and we pan over to see the Decepticons all standing on a cliff nearby. And this shows one of my favorite recurring themes, that the Autobots always think they've gotten the drop on Megatron, but he's almost always aware what they're up to. You're right, you're right, because yeah, Ironhide busted her out just seconds ago, mm -hmm. and they were all like dealing with the, the bomb that hit the side of their building but like it's so when we're like when ironhide gets in and out like well they must not have noticed him because they were too busy fixing all the damages nope megatron knew that happened immediately it's like everybody outside now yep. <laughs> i got some people to laugh at <laughs> <laughs> so megatron now says that he's perfected their little toy and the effect of the immobilizer is now permanent and he plans to use the immobilizer on all of humanity but it turns out the autobots do surprise megatron by Optimus Prime's arrival, and Optimus fires on Megatron, knocking him down. Mm -hmm. The other Autobots behind Prime transform as Prime orders the Decepticons surrender. But Megatron seems to be knocked out on the ground, so I wonder if there's anyone else around interested in taking advantage of this opportunity. Oh, can we all just do a stretch, a couple <laughs> stretch to say, there's the Transformers episode. There we go. Megatron is indisposed for a second. Megatron's doing his taxes. Now I'm in charge. Megatron's <laughs> visiting his grandmother. Now I'm in charge. <laughs> Megatron is taking a nap. Now I'm in charge. <laughs> Megatron fell over and he's just lying on the ground. So now I'm in charge. I'm in charge. Thank you, Starscream, for always being Starscream. <laughs> <laughs> So then Starscream charges the Autobots while Rumble operates the Immobilizer. And Rumble manages to freeze Blue Streak and Gears. And then Carly gets an idea. There's a cool scene here where when Gears gets frozen, they're like, look out, Gears! And Gears starts transforming. And mm -hmm. like it gets frozen mid-transformation. Yeah. And that's one of those things where because the transformations always happen so fast, you never see how the animators are actually really doing it frame by frame. You know, mm -hmm. like, did you ever do like the still, like the skip ahead one frame when you videotape shows? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah I, I did too. 
And so to like get like an actual shot where it's like, oh, that's what it looks like when he's transferring. I don't know. It's not important, but it's one of those nerdy things that I like to get like <laughs> focused in on when I was a kid. But but yeah, Carly gets an idea. What's her idea? Well, now we cut back to the cliff where the Decepticons are standing and we see something kind of subtle, but wonderful. They don't point it out. But remember, Starscream just ordered them all to attack. <laughs> But all the Decepticons are still just standing here as Starscream lands and transforms. <laughs> <laughs> so Starscream was like, attack! And they're like, uh, nah. <laughs> He's like, oh, oh, did I say attack? I meant um, make sure Megatron's okay. That's really what I said. <laughs> so Starscream lands and then Megatron returns to his feet. Rumble's still trying to take out Autobots with the immobilizer and he manages to get Sideswipe too. Mm-hmm. And now Carly asks Braun if they can tunnel underneath the cliff and come up beside the immobilizer. And he thinks it'll be no sweat. So out comes his drill from the front of his vehicle mode that he's used before to tunnel into Decepticon HQ. That was, I think, was that Ultimate Doom? Ultimate Doom Part 1. Yeah. So hats off to this little bit of consistency in the series. You know, we've uh-huh. been doing a lot of pointing out the inconsistencies, but man, we should, you know, set off fireworks when something happens. It's like, <laughs> yeah, just do you remember that happened in Ultimate Doom? I do. That's the thing mm-hmm. Braun can do. Also, I just get excited when any Autobot transforms besides Bumblebee or Hound or Prime and the kids get in. You know, like, mm. oh, well, Jazz, Jazz is another Autobot that you see Spike ride around in, but you never see Spike riding around in Gears or Huffer or Wind Charger or Blue Streak, yeah. right? So whenever another Autobot gives a human a ride, that's exciting to me. But yeah, yeah, he's using his drill. So he starts, he basically like starts pointing down and just starts drilling into the ground, right? <laughs> yeah. So then Megatron yells for Rumble to target Optimus Prime while Carly has Spike radio Bumblebee to get Jazz's participation in her master plan. And Jazz transforms to car mode and pulls up behind the Decepticons, unleashing those new speakers of his along with an accompanying light show. Mm -hmm. And this disrupts Rumble's motor controls as he fumbles and drops the immobilizer remote. Now in the meantime... Braun has tunneled up Carly to the cliff where she switches two wires in the immobilizer and then she hops right back down the tunneled hole. Yeah, like you just see like the drills like sort of come up out of the ground and Carly just jumps out of the hole, mm-hmm. runs up, opens a panel on the immobilizer while Megatron and Rumble are like covering their ears. And like you see this like a red wire and a green wire plugged into a positive and negative terminal and she swaps them and then yep. closes the panel and runs back and jumps down the hole. Also, when Rumble's targeting Optimus, there's a neat, it's a nice shot. It's a really neat looking shot of looking at the immobilizer in the foreground, and then we're looking down this sort of series of ledges, like to a canyon wall, and with giant rock outcroppings that Optimus is like sort of quickly dashing around. Like he runs around one of them and hides behind the next one and like keeps firing off shots at Megatron. So when Rumble's targeting him, Optimus is still being a moving target and like taking cover. Mm. It's a cool little actiony bit that just I wouldn't call it imaginative fight scenes, but it's nice looking. Yeah. So she switches the the wires, jumps back down the hole, and then what happens? Well, Jazz then stops his audio assault, and Rumble tries to resume immobilizing Autobots, only he can't control it anymore. It restores Ironhide to life, who comes to retrieve the device, but he has to fight off Laserbeak in the process. The device fires at everyone that's already been frozen as Sideswipe, Blue Streak, and Gears spring back to life. Now having done its job, Ironhide smashes the immobilizer so Megatron can't have it. Megatron declares that this is only a temporary victory as he and the rest of the Decepticons flee. There's a line of dialogue where Optimus says, that's the last of them, Ironhide. You know, it's like they've, they've all been restored. And like the anxious part of me is like thinking like, but what about, what if there was one who wasn't? Right. <laughs> like what if, what if like, you know, Hoffer was over there. Oh, frozen. we forgot Hoffer. <laughs> Now, going back to one of your previous fan theories about Optimus, it's like, or did he? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to figure since basically Wheeljack and the river just returned to normal after X amount of time, I think that would have happened as well. Mm. But you never know. But yeah, but Megatron is like, he's he's heartbroken because he's that's, that's supposed to be mine. Ah, well, rats, well, Decepticons retreat. Decepticons never retreat. Yes, we do every time. And they fly away. <laughs> So we change scenes where the Autobots are now standing in front of the base during a nice sunset as Ironhide requests permission to return to active duty, which Prime is happy to hear. 
Carly remarks that now she doesn't feel so bad about the trouble that she caused. Art note, yes, the scene is all gold and red. And it's mm-hmm. it's a scene you don't, it's a background painting you don't often see in the series. A handful of times, but not a lot. And it's it's really pretty. It's it's a real, yeah. well, well-constructed, well-blocked, and great color palette. I advise everybody hit pause and just <laughs> take a moment and drink it in. The animators are really working hard here. Mm-hmm. And we cut to Wheeljack looking over his blueprints for the immobilizer, who now asks Carly how she realized she could reverse the effects of it. She then gives a very Star Trek The Next Generation techie answer. It just occurred to me that I could set up a frequency harmonic between the deflector and the shield grid using the warp field generator as a power flow anti-attenuator, and that, of course, naturally created an amplification of the inherent energy output. On how she realized that it could be done as she casually drops the fact that she accepted a science scholarship from MIT. Dang. <laughs> and while she's explaining it, Wheeljack is like shaking his head like, I don't yeah. even know what you're talking about, kid. <laughs> MIT witch? <laughs> Stega, what's this? <laughs> oh, wait, that's spark plug. <laughs> well, then we see Bumblebee, the wingman with no wings, whisper a pickup line into Spike's ear for him to use on Carly. Go out for tomorrow. Oh, uh, Carly... How would you like to go out for an emulsified CO2 with lactic acid? What's that? A chocolate soda. <laughs> You're on. And the pair speed off in Carly's convertible as Spike waves goodbye as the sun goes down. And we get our happy ending. And that is a beautiful ending shot, too. It is. It's a really good looking shot as the car is heading toward us and we're looking down. Like, we're, we're eyes are right on the horizon line looking at the Autobot base as it recedes into the distance. They, they take care to show this quick little shot of spark plug smiling as they're leaving mm-hmm. together. As if to say, oh, my boy's growing up. They don't say anything. There's no dialogue. Right. It's just a quick little flash of Sparkplug being happy for his son, who's now entering a new phase of his of his life, of the dating world and everything. <laughs> but then it's got that cool, just the way the car is moving. Like It's got like a little vibration on it. Mm-hmm. I think Carly's hair is even blowing in the wind. It's a great, great shot. Yeah. I mean, who would have thunk it? That, like this episode would have some like really, really beautiful animation in it. But yeah. Yeah, and so in, in in the way it ends too with Spike going off with Carly, no Autobots. She's driving. He's not with Bumblebee. He's not with his best friend anymore. He's yep. going out with the gal. We're entering this new chapter of the the Transformer series with this new human character who's going to become more important as time goes on. Mm-hmm. And more important. I mean, she's already important. She saved Ironhide. You know, she yep. saved the Autobots. Oh my gosh. She's so, probably already done more to help the Autobots than Spike has done in all these episodes combined. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but but she's pretty great. So like 10,000 feet up, how do we feel about this one? Rewatching this, I thought Carly was awesome. And though she sort of did need rescued at the end, she's clearly depicted as way more capable and useful than Spike in nearly every situation, which I feel was nicely ahead of its time. She's not needing to be rescued by a guy. She's not waiting for a guy to give her permission to do anything. Yeah. I mean, she she goes and bombs the Decepticon headquarters all on her own. You know, I mean, and and this was at a time where it felt like we were on two tracks. There was the persistence of the kinds of stories for, well, in all media where the woman needed saving by a man, which was unfortunate that that stereotype persisted. Or they went the other way and said, like, you can't do this. You're a girl. And then she does mm-hmm. something amazing. And then like, what? How yeah. can that happen? And that got <laughs> tired real fast. So hats off to, who wrote this one again? Was it Earl Cress? Mm-hmm. Hats off to Earl Cress because instead of drawing any attention to it, he just has her show up and be super capable, emotionally intelligent, super smart, and really resourceful and useful to the team. Mm-hmm. And also, on top of it, you know, really appealing and compelling to the young man character. Right? She's she's everything. Yep. Uh, you're right. You're right. Like, especially considering some of the problematic storytelling we got ahead of us with mm-hmm. female characters, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that she's as good as she is right here out of the box and without drawing any attention to it whatsoever. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow. Very awesome. And we're certainly going to see more of her, though sadly not a whole lot more. No, no. And yeah, um, there's like a two-parter where she plays a pretty pivotal role, but mm-hmm. not like this. 
This right. is a pretty strong start for the character, and the more I think about what she does later on, I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, there's some of these episodes I haven't watched like in ten years, but I don't remember her being this capable in some of the later episodes, or at least yeah. having this much of a role to play. Let me put it that way. Correct. Yeah. So I'd say, all in all, not a stupendous episode, but pretty darn good. Wow, that is a better review than I expected. I really thought that you were going to have, this is going to be more of like a, eh, mm-hmm. And honestly, it's all because of Carly. I mean, the Decepticons don't really do anything special that was wonderful. Yeah. There's that really menacing scene with Megatron watching her, quote unquote, mm-hmm. drown. That part, yeah, I, I mean, feel definitely like, Frank Welker has some great Megatron lines in here for sure. Yeah. But yeah, the rest of the Decepticons don't really don't do that much except mm-hmm. just be bad guys. Yeah. And it's really centered around Ironhide's emotional journey of feeling inadequate and feeling like he doesn't belong. And I guess that's another thing that like I would say gives it points for me as an episode. I think this is probably one of the things that I found appealing about it as a child is that it's so easy to forget that you belong, right? Mm. All it takes is one mistake and, and and it's one of those things where it's like you remember a negative comment so much more readily than a positive comment right like right. a thousand people could tell you you're great but then one person says you stink that's the thing you're going to focus on mm-hmm. and it's the same thing with your accomplishments right it's like oh well yeah you've you've made this you've produced that you've changed these people's lives in this way yeah well but this one thing i failed on you know <laughs> yeah. it's really easy to slip into that you know and and it's i think it's a good story for young people and i think this is one of those ones where it's like going back to this whole idea of things holding up i think it holds up into adulthood if we really look at it carefully because we fall off of that horse over and over again. It's one of those things where, when I'm mentoring young people and they're like, well, I just want to get to the point where I have like a lot of skill and I don't have to think about it anymore. I'm like, well, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> You're kind of like, and this is why I like Rodimus so much because Rodimus is the guy who's like, all right, he's in charge. Why is he still, why is he still unhappy? Well, because it's like, it's really hard and you are constantly screwing up and doubting yourself all the time. So mm-hmm. I think this one is special for that reason too. So, yeah, and I, I don't know. I don't know. I, do I have any critiques? I, I can't think of how I would, I would improve or elaborate on Ironhide's journey in this one. It seems pretty straightforward. He's feeling sorry for himself, and then he proves that he's capable, and he can succeed, and then he's feeling less sorry for himself. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty cut and dry journey. He goes down. I can't think of any ways I would tweak it myself. Yeah. And who knew? Who knew? I mean, this is one that I remembered a lot as a kid. I have very fond and strong memories for. But I think I probably subconsciously, it was because of Carly, I wouldn't have acknowledged Carly as a kid. I would have said, like, yeah, she's fine. Mm -hmm. But I'm here for the Autobots like Carly is, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, wow. Wow. (laughs) I didn't realize how much I liked her until until this episode. That's great. Yeah. Again, you know, it's like... It's just watching, rewatching the show for the intent of doing this has opened up so many more, not takes, but like just made me feel so many different ways about the show that I wasn't expecting. Yeah. Yeah. This is awesome. Okay. So what, what do we got next? Well, next up is the Autobot Run. The Autobot Run. I'm guessing this is the race one with Augie Kane. Or am I thinking of a different one? Oh, that's a different one. That's that's the Trans Europe Express or something like that, right? Uh, I think you're right. But the Autobot Run is by Donald F. Glute. And we should point out that, yes, we've been made aware that we were mispronouncing <laughs> his last name <laughs> wrong all this time. Uh, it's Glute, apparently. G-L-U-T. Glute, not glut, like we were saying over and over and over. We were speaking out of our Gluttious Maximuses when we were mispronouncing it. <laughs> and our apologies to Mr. Glute. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Autobot Run, I don't know if I have any memory of this one off the top of my head. So this will be a fun one to dive into, I hope. Yeah, I don't I don't have too many memories of it myself, but I did learn that it's another one of those badly animated episodes. Oh, I know which one it is now. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we will screw up our courage and do our best. <laughs> Thank you, Hoover. This and Fire in the Sky are my two favorite episodes so far of the, the podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> your, your comparison between me and Carly is going to get me through some dark times. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did a great job swimming down and planting that bomb, let me tell you. <laughs> 
Oh, all right. So we record the show weekly. It it drops on Thursdays, and you can find it at four million years dot com or on your favorite podcatcher. And if you think we do a good job, a great way to let us know is to write a five star review or just give us a five star review wherever you listen. Or if you really think we did an excellent job, like a twenty five percent tip. You'd write a review, just a paragraph. <laughs> Three things that you like about the show. Three things that I like this, this, and this. Boom, you're out. And you don't have to think about it anymore. Or you could just write, Hoover is way better than Jersey and just call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> or you could say, Jersey is so much nicer than Hoover and then call it a day. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> That's our Battle Beast battle badges. <laughs> <laughs> better, better is better than better. <laughs> nice, nice is nicer than nicer. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. I think I'm punchy. All right, let's let's go home. So thank you to everybody who's been downloading and listening. And until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of four million years later dot com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I have been the Hoovalizer. Okay, bye. Bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. Closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash Nicholas Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4millionyearslater.com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>